Welcome. Uh, I'm having an interview today about uh, aviation, the RAF and wokeness and all sorts of things. And I'm joined by Tim Davies. How are you, sir? Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, You do the the YouTube channel Fast Jet Performance. That's right. Yep, still going on that. Yeah, all sorts of crazy content. And um, I've got a flight school in the virtual world now as well that I teach people to fly on. And a little dicky bird told me you used to... Fly fast jets? Is something that right? about that, yeah. I've heard something about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. well, the thing is, I started writing about, um, well, aviation in general and the Royal Air Force in general. I was in the Navy for five years prior to that. I started writing back in 2013 and questioning whether what we were doing could be done any better. Basically, that was it. Are we doing this the best way? Because no one's regulating us as such. A squadron is a small band of people that tends to regulate itself. So, my argument was look, are we management leadership? Are we doing everything correct here? And then that got into a series of essays and they all came out. I put them on the website and I think the Air Force started hating me for, for doing that. I was going to say, did that get you into a bit of deep water? Yeah, I used to publish, and sometimes it would go out on a Sunday night, and then I used to sort of lie in bed, eyes because I knew that Monday morning. And like really? sometimes I'd publish and get a phone call, like straight away as it went really? up. Someone, someone senior, someone would phone me up. And uh, I try to keep it as generic as possible, but I kind of realised then there was a, a foundational fragility probably within some areas of the service. And most definitely what we were doing on the squadron in flying training was very new. So I was obviously touching a raw nerve there. And then mm. since then, I've been really trying to work out how I can make my school better by using those things that I learned when I was in. So, mm. yeah. So you talk about senior people there, but you were uh, relatively senior, right? I mean, you you uh, were an instructor telling yeah. people how how to fly tornadoes and hawks and things. Yeah, well, I was um, so I was a tornado GL4 pilot and uh, electronic warfare instructor back in the day. And then from then I went down and teaching on the Hawk T1 at RF Valley, stayed at RF Valley and then taught on the Hawk T2. And that was because I went to Afghanistan in between those two tours and the the Harrier was decommissioned, the the, um, the Royal Air Force Harrier. And I was supposed to go back onto the Tornado Squadron, which I was looking forward to going back onto. But there were, there were lots of Harrier mates that were Harrier pilots that were looking to go into sort of flight commander positions, which is a position of authority. And so they gave my slot to one of those guys because I was out of the country. And when I came back, they said, you know, we still want you to, to go in a flight commander position because you've just been promoted, but can you go back to Valley and bring this new aircraft in called the Hawk T2? And I was stupid enough to say yes, <laughs> to bring in a Mark 1 aircraft, you know what I mean? Well, Mark 2 aircraft in effect, but the first, you know, the first sort of tranche of this aeroplane. I'm going to put pictures up in post-production so people know what we're talking about. But if people don't know, sort of the Hawk T1 is is the Red Arrows yeah. craft. Yeah, ours, ours are black, but yeah, absolutely. Exactly the same. There's no difference between the aircraft. They have a smoke pod on theirs, obviously, for the display. Um, but ours are exactly the same. That's right. So I wonder if I could just ask you a couple, just a quick question about that. It's known, in, I'm wrong, we've had a conversation before, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but the T1 is notoriously difficult to fly, I know, compared to some other craft, which lots of things are automated for you, isn't it? The, the, the T1 is very manual. You, you have to know, you have to do everything for yourself. Yeah, it's, it's like um, my wife's got an MG Midget and I'm, I swear some of the dials in her car were in that aeroplane. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> really? it's Bakelite dials and stuff. It's all old school. Um, yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it was, okay, so what is easy, what is difficult when it comes to jet aviation? I mean, the Typhoon, uh, it's not going to kill you. It's a carefree handling aeroplane, whereas the Hawk is the aircraft that will get to the highest G level you can get to faster than any, any other aircraft. So we we do have problems with G onset. Uh, we've had fatalities with pilots that have pulled too, many, too much G too quickly and have been killed. Uh, one of those is in the Red Arrows, of course. Um, so yeah, it's we, we it takes a long time to train someone up on it, but the way I looked like flying the Hawk T1 was it was a bit of a, a bit of an art form. Right. And it was very enjoyable. Right. Every pilot that came through the Hawk T1 would always want to come back to the Hawk T1 because it was very um, person drolic, shall we say, <laughs> as opposed to man right. drolic. But yeah, you had to put some thought into it and care for him. You know, right. Yeah, I feel like if you've mastered the T1, then uh, most other things will be easier. I feel like if, if you can race... A Porsche 911, for example, yeah. notoriously yeah. difficult. Oh, yeah. um, then you can go into other things, and it's it's just not as bad. Well, we teach on it. Well, we did used to teach on it. We teach on the, the T2 now, which again is very similar to the T1. It's just got more avionics in it, and it's got screens and the, the low level navigation. For example, you're following a green line in the Hawk T2, whereas in the Hawk T1, it was a map in your hand. You had a big compass in front of you, and you had a stopwatch. And that's how you got around at low level. Right. And that was hard. There's no toys right. about it. No one, yeah. no one enjoyed that. You know, it was um, fighting the weather as well and getting bounced by another aircraft trying to attack you the whole time. So the T2 was, was following green writing. Modern jets, and I teach in a simulator on the F-18, for example. The reason I use two, I use the F-5 and the F-18. And the reason I use those two is because the F-5 is quite a hard aircraft to fly. But it's, it's kind of, 
well, it's kind of a lot easier. Well, it's harder to fly, but it's easy to operate. Whereas F-18 is easy to fly, but it's quite hard to operate because you've got screens and menus and sub-menus and lots of weapon systems and fuse settings. So it kind of complements each other. And the Hawk was, uh, was a pleasure to fly, but yeah, it took some learning. And once you got yourself through that, you've learned all the, the techniques you need to go and fly typhoons, F-35s, tornadoes, whatever it was. <laughs> I've heard you talk about how um, you need to, at some level, uh, once you've uh, progress past a certain level that you need to just sort of fly the thing sort of stop thinking stop trying to second mm. guess yourself and just fly sort of be in the moment yeah uh, is that yeah. very much the case in a t1 because i think a lot of people including myself are fans of the hawk t1 yeah it's everyone's everyone of... loves it it's yeah and we've, we've unfortunately got rid of it now the reds are, are stagging theirs on for a bit right um and we've got we're taking the black ones now gonna paint them red they're gonna be spares for the for the reds fleet so we're still right. seeing that but no one else is flying t1s in the country i think we've got rid of all the other squadrons now so it's only the reds that are flying the t1 and we'll still love it yeah um so yeah the, you, you might be talking about flow states something like that and i i found that the more complicated sort is i was involved in the more you could get into that it's a meditative state isn't it in effect right. it's um i don't know it's when people get <laughs> it's when people do meditation don't they and they feel very kind of right. they feel very relaxed Sometimes, of course, in jets, it can kill you if you go into a meditative state. But with T1, um, for example, instrument flying, I used to lock my harness. And so I was locked and I could hang forward in the straps. And then I would just be hanging in the straps, very light on the controls, a lot of trimming, um, setting the power I needed. You know, power, attitude, trim equals, equals performance. It gives you the performance of the aircraft. And you, you do get very much into making sure the instruments are, are hardly moving at all. You know, right. so you, you keep that, you keep exactly where you need to be. And yeah, and it's, um, I kind of missed that, but I've still got it in the sim world now. So. Right, yeah, because you do tons of sim work. We'll, we'll, I will talk about that. I do too much sim work, to be fair. My eyes, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to need glasses soon. <laughs> Staring into a virtual reality thing the whole time, honestly, <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. With the, uh, with, uh, we've talked, I think you mentioned this before, but with like the, the Hawks, um, they're some sort of equivalent would be like, um, I don't know, maybe a Caterham or a little Lotus yeah. Elise or something. It's yeah. small, nippy, and like you say, you can pull... Crazy G's in, yeah, a, in yeah. a Hawk, like more than an F-18 or something. More than a Typhoon F-18, Because it's yeah. the rate at which yeah. you can turn or accelerate or whatever. Yeah, the onset rate of G. So an F-18 is way faster than a T-1, for example. Yeah. And it's way more sophisticated in all sorts of ways. But a T-1 will make you sort of, can do, what was it like, a, but different terms for blacking out, essentially. Aren't yeah, so, yeah, G&G's G &G loss of consciousness. Yeah, G-lock G -lock, yeah. and things like that. And so That's right. it really is um, sort of a... It can be, it has been a killer. Yeah, we, we call it like a little sports car. You know, as everyone knows, the T1 is is like your MG Midget. You know, it's it's not the fastest car on the road. Well, it's still, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's still doing, it's up to around about 480 knots at low level. So it's, I think that was what, I mean, it's still still quick. I think it was limited to 500 at low level when I was doing the test work on it as a, as a maintenance test pilot. So it's still, and it can get up to, well, speed and G have a relationship. So the faster you go, the more G you can pull. And of course, if you are pulling G, then you have a high alpha. So um, more of an angle to the airflow. So you are going to slow down quicker. And then we get into technical talk and I want to be doing that on you. Fine. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so you can get to your 8G. I think 8G was our limit in the Hawk. The F-18 is limited to 7.5, for example. Right, and right. then you can you can go to 10 if you paddle it out. I don't want to spoil any uh, <laughs> Top Gun Maverick film that people haven't seen yet. But um, but yeah, the Hawk, you know, if you do it, if you do it, rap, if you do it badly, it will kill you. And uh, the Reds of Vitality in 2011, I was in, I was involved in investigating that, where one of them was killed on the break down mm. in Bournemouth. Mm. And um, yeah, they were they yeah, they pulled too much G on the break, and it, it, it's uh, he went into a state of John um, John Egan's went, went into a state of uh, a lock or p lock, so partial induced loss of a lock. So basically, if we did that, I could just nudge you and go, "Hey, come around, what's up?" And you'd be like, "Oh, I know where I am." G lock would take you about 45 seconds to recover from, right. and you wouldn't know where you were in the cockpit. Right. So it's like that's different. a real yeah. You want to stay out of that terrible, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do strain to keep the blood as well up into the, the brain. Everything. So there's a couple of things there you've said already. Just one last thing on the red arrows. Uh, you know, like they there was a, an accident, something happened there, and and they called Tim Davies. So what I'm hearing is they didn't call me. Oh. <laughs> they did not call me. No, uh, I had a lot of a lot of guys on the team and um, uh, Kirsty as well. She's on the team. Friends of mine, I like them all. No, they didn't call. What happens is they look for a subject matter expert. I was on the, I just finished on the T1. I just came back from Afghanistan and uh, the, the course I was waiting for was slightly delayed. So I had a few months that I was just on the squadron for and they needed someone to go. So they make up three, uh, it should be tri-service really. It just so happened we had two guys from the Air Force and one guy from the Army who was the engineering consultant on the team. So you have the SME, someone that knows the aircraft very well and has flown it. You have the, the lead of the inquiry and then you have the engineering element so i was also op so i did a lot of the admin stuff 
And then we make up that, we get read in by the MAA, um, Military Aviation Authority, and then we go and do the work uh, on the team, which was actually quite a sad thing to do, to be oh, fair. Yeah, and I, I yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah. No, no one's winning out of that one at all. Yeah, no, because I mean, they are the best of the best. I mean, I'm bound to say that being a Brit, um, being, being yeah. biased, but they are, I mean, I do think they are considered the best of the best. Yeah, other teams um, look at the Reds and I think they hold the Reds right. up to quite high esteem. Yeah, right. So. so, I mean, it's uh, amazing that, uh, I mean, such a high level, I mean, the RAF in general is considered, you know, I think one of the greatest. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's a shame because they have just sent, sent a guy back from Cyprus for an infraction. And it's probably to do with him, you know, having one too many beers or whatever, because it's, it, you know, you got to be professional. There's no toys about it, right? So the team is an exceptionally professional team, but I think the way they run their their camp where they select new pilots um, needed to be refined. They needed to do some work on that. And I think what happened is they, they most definitely when I was in the service, this is how I remember it, the new pilots go out. There's normally about six or seven of them. And um, the team are just seeing whether the guys can, can hack it, the guys and girls. So they keep them out late at night, have a few beers kind of thing, maybe go down a few bars and then in the morning they kind of fly them as well to make sure that you know mm. the work hard play hard and uh i think one of the guys probably got himself in a bit of trouble you know and uh, got sent home so god that's interesting because you, you th i hear of like um uh special forces selection for example and quite mm. often it's the lot of sort of sleep deprivation yeah that's right and just pushing you to your physical limit yeah um, how do you do that for a pilot you right know? Because right. you know, when you're when you're on flag and stuff like this, when you're on red flag and these big exercises, I did tactical leadership program in Belgium when I came through on the on the GR four on the tornado. It was heavy drinking, and I'm not even, it, and it's full on because you know I remember I had a guest on recently on my uh, one called Paul Chameling, lovely dude, and he had a great line. He said, "Anyone that makes an aircraft carrier without a bar is without a bar is a psychopath." You know, because <laughs> right. by the time you land on it, you're like just you know raw nerves. <laughs> just give me a beer. Um, but you, you can't condone that activity anymore. Times have changed now. You know, we're not talking all Chuck Yeager days of getting, right. having a few beers and climbing into these big jets and going to break in speed of sound. You've, you've got to be respectful of the machinery you're flying and the people you're working with and professionalism has to be there. And I, I would say, I would say that those, it's a very different environment now, it seems, than when I came through. Um, and yeah, so I think, um, yeah, you, you, how do you push pilots to see whether they can handle it? You know, you, 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 like we used to, you throw them at the pub throw them at the bar, and then you make them fly in the morning. <laughs> We've all been there. That could have been me that got that got sent home. It's you know. interesting. It's like, you know, like the James Hunt thing. Where yeah, you, I do. People used to be a uh, race driver sometimes anyway. Yeah, yeah, James Hunt was a classic. Quite often, yeah. like playboys and drink hard, play hard. Yeah. And then you've got the real, just a serious, serious individual, more like maybe a Nigel Mansell type. Well, a clinician. They, so start right. looking at clinicians now. Right. So um, you, could, you could talk about motor racing now, couldn't you? I think some of the drivers in, in F1 have got – um, you know, they, people know they're like a, a beer sort of thing. I think, I think Kimi was one of those people. And mm. you've got other ones that are ultimate professionals that would stay away from it. You know what I mean? They wouldn't do that. And I think you're right. I think the service is changing a bit more into that latter stage with aircraft like the F-35 coming in. But when I came in, um, I came obviously through the Navy and uh, the Navy pilots, the Sea Harry mates, um, were were known as being gash, and what that meant was they had their sleeves rolled up, and they always, you know, had a cigarette on the burn, and they had they were always in the bar and ditting on flight suits undone, and you know, it, it was a, it was kind of lads' culture, and it was in the just, navy, in the navy, yeah, yeah, and it was a great place to be. <laughs> and then, um, and they had this saying, look, well, because we tried to emulate them because we're young students, of course, so we all got our sleeves rolled up and everything, and you can't fly in jets with the sleeve rolled up. You can, but if anyone catches you because of the micro detonation cord on the canopy, if it goes bang because you eject, it's going to burn all your skin up. So you're supposed to have your flight suits down. Um, I always have my flight suit up. I used to fly without a visor. I used to take my visor up, which is a silly thing to do because if a bird strike hits your jet, it's going to take out your face. Um, but I felt I felt I couldn't see as well with another piece of a plexiglass or whatever in front of my face. So I used to fly without a visor at low level a lot on the tornado, which is a silly thing to do. But you know, birds used to bounce off that jet. So we used to emulate these these guys. And they, they would say to us, these Sea Harrier pilots, they would say, no, you've got to be good to be gash. Like, be good oh, right, first, right, right, you know what right, I mean? Right. So be a good pilot first, and then you can take shortcuts. <laughs> then you're allowed. Yeah, and we were like, oh, it's going to be gash, you know, you get the beers in. So, um, but I, I want to make clear, it's not it's not a massive, I think the drinking cultures of old have, have changed. Right. Younger generations don't do it. Yeah. They just, they don't do it in the same way that we did it, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So like we, smoking, when I was a kid, everyone yeah. smoked? I smoked, yeah. Everyone smoked. Yeah, I did like, as well. Heavily, and, and now hardly anyone does. I mean, very, it's rare. You don't see many, do you? You I, see a twenty-year-old go and buy a twenty Benson hedges. You just don't yeah. really see it, you know. I, I was a mobile lights guy. I used to, um, <laughs> even when I stopped, even when I stopped smoking, and it was, must have been uh, about ten years, twelve years ago. I even had a packet of ten mobile lights in my flight suit with a with a lighter on the outside in a waterproof bag, 
So if I threw a jet away somewhere, being an idiot, I could still get smoke on. And I kept that packet of cigarettes there probably for a couple of years until I, I got rid of it. Like even if you ditched in the ocean, you could I'll still... I'd be smoking myself <laughs> yeah, in, my little, in my little raft to get, let's get a smoke on, you know what I mean? Yeah. So just but, to mention real quick, you mentioned there the Navy. So you're, in, you're a commissioned officer in the Royal Navy for about five years and yeah. then switched over to... The, the RAF for a yeah. good 15 odd years. Was it? Uh, 15 I did, yeah. And the reason I did that, because the Sea Harrier was decommissioned. Um, I was one of the pilots about to go onto it. My air defence wasn't brilliant either. And there were about seven or eight guys behind me and a couple in front of me, I think it was. And uh, we, we were told, you, we just can't take people onto the Sea Harrier anymore because we're going to decommission it. It's going out of service. Right. Um, so... Is this All sort you of guys, the early 2000s? Is it, this yeah, a... I think Paul corrected me the other day. I think it was 2005 or something like that, I think it was, for the Sea Harrier. And... Um, and so that was when I was coming out of training and I was around about 2003, 2004 when I was coming out of training. So um, the Air Force, well, the Navy said, you guys are going to have to go and retread and start helicopter training. And we're like, we don't know anything about helicopters. Right. I've been flying jets for three and a half years in training. I don't know anything about helicopters. So none of us really wanted to do that, but we all wanted to stay in the Navy. That was the thing. Right. And so what we negotiated with the Air Force, the Air Force phoned us all up. In fact, the guy phoning me up is now the head of the Air Force, a guy called Mike Wigston. So Mike Wigston, actually, he's a lovely dude. And he phoned me up and said, Tim, it's... Um, the appointer for the Air Force. He was the guy that took people into the Air Force. He said, look, you can retread on helicopters or I'm phoning all your dudes as well, the other pilots, and we're all offering you to come across to the Air Force because you've been trained. Um, and, the, and the Air Force was training all the Navy students anyway. Some some of the instructors were also Navy guys, but all the training was done by the Air Force. And I didn't really want to go across because you're very proud of your service. And uh, so I had a good chat with him, had a good chat with some guys in the Navy I knew and some guys in the Air Force. And uh they offered, him, they offered us pretty much anything to fly. So I, I said, well, I'd like to go to Scotland and fly tornadoes. And I didn't know really why I wanted to do that. I just knew that it was a community that was really well spoken about, the tornado community, GR4, low-level stuff. My low-level was more interesting to me than the air combat stuff was. And I was better at low-level stuff than I was at the air combat. Because right. air combat is about seeing pictures. So when, when you see a picture, of it, we see, you look out the canopy and you see an aircraft on its side, you've got to be able to take a snapshot of the energy state and the angles of that aircraft relative to you. And that takes time to build up. And I think I was just a slow learner in that um, air to air stuff. So I'll teach wow. it now because I've taught for ages, but wow. out, out going through, you know, and also being not great at something and then ending up teaching it, you, you're able to teach it really well because you've made the mistakes that all the young students are making and you can go, mate, I, I can, you know, so it's great for me to be able to give something back. But yeah, I went on to Tornado GR4, had a great career. I think I went on to the best squad I possibly could have gone on to, full of wastes and strays. And, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. It's very specific, some very specific skills. Like, for example, you mentioned there being able to glance at something, take a snapshot in a, like, less than a tenth of a second, I think, maybe, yeah. and um, make almost instantaneous, all sorts of calculations almost instantaneously. And that I imagine that that's, well, it's, it's a learned skill. You, I mean, no one's born with that, I imagine. And I've heard you talk about how uh, you look down, can glance down at your controls mm. and you're used to knowing exactly what your eye needs to, to glance at yeah. or not. And obviously you have to be taught that. Um, but yeah. it seems to someone, a normal person like me, someone's <laughs> never flown a fast jet, it seems sort of um, almost... Uh, incomprehensible when you look inside the cockpit of something like a GR4. Of course, it's complete gobbledygook to me. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. But yeah. I take it f for you, even now. I mean, I remember, I remember you saying when you were doing some uh, virtual stuff in the GR4 yeah. and you hadn't sat in the real thing for a while. Yeah. I can't remember, a few yeah, months, or a couple of years or no, something. Years, years, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and you said it more or less, more or less just came back. You, it was yeah. because the virtual thing is so realistic to the real thing. Yeah, absolutely. It was just like, Oh, this is what you do. It's like riding a bike almost. Or am I exaggerating? No, that? you're not. No. So me and the big jet now, the GR, they call it the swing wing messenger of death, you know, <laughs> or the land shark because I had the massive fin at the back and used to. Um, yeah, when I when I got in that under virtual reality, that was a game called X-Plane. I teach on digital combat sim now, but that was me just, someone asked me to go and fly this GR for YouTube and I went, I'll give it a go. And I got in there and looked around and went, oh, they, I know the batteries and the generators are, I've got it. Um, I'll get the left started, whatever, I'll get the right started. And it, it does come back. Um, there are some bits and pieces, some utils checks I would have missed, utility checks I would have missed and things like that. And I, I kind of can skip that because it's a sim, right? You know, and I haven't got a navigator in the back lecturing me somewhere. But yeah, it comes back. And um, now I was chatting to someone else about this actually the other day and he, what did he fly? He said, you said the muscle memory is there still and that doesn't really go. Yeah. So he said that you find your hands moving and doing the same things. And I, I kind of... I found my my mouse pointer, you know, doing all that kind of thing, moving around the same way. And uh, yeah, it's just really good. I, I think the thing about flying and the thing about doing sims now, they've got so good that it's 
it's almost like therapy. And it's, it, as I said, it's meditative. And there are checks you need to go through. And that's process, isn't it? And if, we, if we're going through process, if we're doing something deliberately in steps, then we are in a, a kind of almost a flow state, really. We're ticking things off from a checklist. And I think, um, and that's why when you look around the cockpit and you know where to look, because you're, you're taught uh, an instrument scan and, and you're obviously looking for the piece of information you need at that particular time and you know where it is. Mm. So it's not the most complicated thing in the world. It just takes a lot of time. My mum could learn to fly jets if I had 10 years to teach her, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> I haven't got 10 years to teach my mum, you know what I mean? But. That was the uh, term I was looking for, like your instrument scan. Yeah. So I remember asking you once about one of those uh, 1960s crazy, like a U2 type or one of those, one of those, and you said it's one of the craziest instrument scans you've ever seen. It's SR-71 one, right? Yes, yeah, that's it. And you I, said that's yeah. one who of would, the hardest would, scans I've ever seen. Who would fly that? Exactly. It's like your eyes are going to be doing. But again, what, if you spoke to an SR-71 guy or girl, uh, what they would say is they would say, right this is how i do it okay so i start this is my priority this is my primary instrument it's probably the attitude indicator so that really for the sr71 he'd probably say or she'd say is is the is the real key one right. now other things come into play depending on what part of flight i'm at am i taking off am i landing am i in right. the cruise right. um things are more important like i don't need to touch my gear or my flaps or any of those things if i'm in the cruise i don't care about that kind of stuff but on landing i do so my hand will be over there. I've got speeds taken into account. There's a limit a limit operating indication. So what's the limit of it? Now I've got to operate it. Now I've got an indication that the service has been selected. So I know it's been selected, you know, or it's down. It's doing what it does. So yeah, there's all these things. And you remember a lot of it, this is why the bar was so good, was um, finish your flying day, you go to the bar, get, you know, 19 points, just starting. Um, <laughs> you get your beer and whatever. And, uh, and you chat about your flights with all your buddies. And some of them would fail trips. Someone done really, really well as well, and they want to talk about that. And why not listen to to a dude or a dude that's done well flying? Listen to that person. You know, they've done well. I want to listen to you. Tell me how you did it. Because you're only three trips away from failing, and then you're then you're chucked out. So you don't want those three trips. What's know? that term when if you bugger up this flight, this one flight, you're yeah. done? Yeah, you're chopped. Chopped. You said you had a couple of those yourself. Chop rides. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and I, and to be fair, and you've. Done the other side. Yeah, I've given I've given chop rides to people, and it's it's not a nice feeling. But I was always privileged to to be able to give a chop ride to a student that was struggling because I'd be in that position myself. And a lot of students, when they when their flying career is terminated, um, they get quite emotional. And men and women, by the way. Now, women get more emotional than men. It just so happens. Men, I've I've had men cry on me, you know, loads of times. If it's your childhood dream, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. But. You know, you do have an obligation to their parent not to kill their son or Right, board. yeah, so, sure. And uh, and the, the aircraft are expensive and we could do with them back. So <laughs> unfortunately, people do meet, do, you know, meet the end of the road at some point. And so when it happened to me, yeah, I, I was kind of pretty sanguine about it. Like, this is my chop ride. I think I had maybe one or two at different stages in flying training. Most people, fa most people fail trips. You fail trips because you have a bad day. You fly with a dude you don't get on with or a, or, or a girl or whatever. And... Yeah, and sometimes you just, you don't know what you're supposed to do. There was a great instructor I had. I was her first student and she was um, called Kirsty Murphy. She, she, had a, she, had a mate, uh, she had a maiden name before, Kirsty Stewart. I was her first student. She was a creamy, so she was a student that had been taken off to, to, to not go forward in the flying, but to, to be an instructor. So to stay in the, and the good students, we can do that. A good student, they hate it, by the way. If the, and then what they try to do at the end, if we're looking at a student to be a creamy instructor to take him off, most of those students will start failing trips intentionally so they, they can go to the front line. Oh, really? Yeah, because they don't, they don't <laughs> want to stay at Valley and instruct. Kirsty, I was her first student. And one thing Kirsty, she gave me some great advice. She said, um, she said, look, think about, and this is what I use in my school now, think about what you've got to do to fail this trip, right? Because if you work out how to fail the trip and you don't do those things, by definition, you're not going to fail. Right? All right. So it was like, okay. I said, so what do you mean? You've got a whiteboard out. And she's like, right. So let's say you don't make your ejection seat live and I've got to prompt you for it. It's a safety hazard, right? Yeah, okay. So make sure I do that, you know. And there was other, you know, things like that. So radio calls in the correct place. You know, what is the sort of what we're doing? Checks that I've got to do in the climb. So if you if you work out, you know, what what might get you, safety normally fails your sortie. If you're, if you're unsafe for some reason, and there's many ways you can be unsafe. Not, in, you know, not intentionally. It's just by accident you can right. be unsafe because sure. you're learning. So um, I learned a lot from her doing that. But um, yeah, so if I had to do a top ride with a student, you know, I'd walk back in with them and I'd tell them as we're walking back in, I'd say, look, we're just not going to take this any further. All right. And normally they'd be very upset. But the, the reason they were upset was because it was a relief that that journey had ended. Like right. they haven't got to do that anymore. Yeah, One guy actually yeah. turned around to me and said, 
are you sure I don't have to do this anymore? <laughs> right. And I'm like, dude, let me find you something else to fly. <laughs> let me get you something else to fly. And I actually got my phone out there before he actually got back in the building. I got my phone up there. I said, what are you interested in? He says, I'm interested in rotary. So helicopters. I give my dude a call. I phone my dude. Have you got any slots going on? He said, let me have a check for you. I'll get back to you. He got back to me in 10 minutes and he had some slots. So I could put that guy directly into the rotary program. Right. That obviously went through a board because we have to, the, a board is convened at station commander level and they, they talk about the dude skill sets you know can we put them back in because sometimes you, you fail and what you're failing for is maybe an inability to retain information or something i don't know so cognitive impairment um and maybe you can't place them back into aviation as a pilot or you know maybe you can put them in as maybe they can, you know they might they might make a great weapons officer uh, or navigator you know which is the same thing the terms change they might want to go and do drone work in the states um flying predators something like that so there's other, you know, they get a choice. Mm. We, we always try and give guys and girls a choice, you know. There's one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I've heard you say a couple of different things on this. Uh, I guess a combat, an actual combat mission would be different. But in, that, say, a GR4, and it's not a combat, it's training, do you get much time to really enjoy it? Because I've heard you say, um, no, usually you've got plenty to do. There's loads of things to do. And other time, I think one other time I've heard you say that, no, once you've, if you've got everything sorted out and it's four minutes to the next time you have to do anything yeah. then you can sort of look out and enjoy yourself and yeah. i just wondered what that's like whether you really get to you know enjoy your time up there or, or, or well, if it's, it's not like that it's a working environment the cockpit is right. a working environment right. and right. and um it's not a glider it's not we're not sitting there catching the next thermal it, it is it is a it's a workplace environment it's like me saying i'm sure you guys here would say yeah i really enjoy working here but it's still work you got to come in right you know you got to do that work um, in a jet, there's a jet flying is a, there's a lot of things that make up jet flying. It, there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of debriefing. There's a lot of, um, relationship management between people on the squadron. There's uh, your career, you're trying to look after your career, you're your own career manager, you know, then you've got to be as good, if not better as the next guy. I was AC standards. So I, my job as a flight commander was to uphold all the flying training and standards on what actually happened then to be probably the largest squadron in Europe, the largest fast jet squadron in Europe, 80 pilots we had, eight zero. And I have to maintain all the standards. Luckily, pilots are pretty good at maintaining their own standards. Mm. But you've still got to maintain your own standard, um, your level of flying. And there's a lot of work to do in the evening. And so, and then you get into a jet. So sometimes being in the aeroplane is the smallest amount right. of your, mm. your day. Mm. And sometimes you're like, oh, have I got to fly? Because I've got so much other stuff to do. There's a lot to do on the squadrons. There's just a lot to do. I, I don't know why there's a lot to do, but there is always a lot to do. And um, there's always some detachment to plan or some presentation or paper for the boss that he wants written on statistics that you don't care about, but you got to do it. Hmm. And then and there's the flight. And I remember sometimes people coming into my office and, and saying, we're briefing, we're briefing. I'm like, seriously, I thought it was fun. No, we brought it forward. And you're like, oh God. And then you, you run through the briefing room and you run through the jet and it's a bit of a rolling goat from then on. But <laughs> but yes, I, I would say in response to that, sometimes like a low level sortie, I'd plan to go down, say the Great Glen or come back in via say Tain Range or whatever. And um do a first run attack on a target. And then you've, you've done all the work, you've been flying around, you've come back in and you drop on tame range and they say, yeah, direct hit. And then you realize that what you've done, as in the whole sortie when you land, you think, yeah, that was worthwhile doing it. You know, But at, right. at the moment, in, in, at the time when you're actually in it, um, I've got a mate I live next to down in uh, near Cheltenham and, and he says that he was a typhoon pilot. He would sometimes look out and he'd say, I want to be walking on those hills, not flying above them. Right. And it's just that kind of thing. It's like you don't get time to <laughs> to really appreciate views. And it's it's kind of sad like that, really. But then it's a job. Yeah. And sometimes yeah, you get given much. a jet and they say, take a jet for an hour. You're like, what am I going to do? Um, okay, I'll, I'll go and, in fact, my my house, this will go out and I'll get haters for this. Um, we were looking to buy a house when I transitioned out of the military. And I, before I left the military, on my very last sortie, I um, was able to fly over that house so and <laughs> got a picture in the head-up display of me doing a strafing attack on on the house i now live in <laughs> uh, it was my nice. target it was my target yeah and, uh, <laughs> and now i live in that village and i think actually the students have found out where i live now because i get a lot of a lot of jet traffic over my house and, oh, really uh, yeah so <laughs> someone's obviously found out where i am i've tried to keep a low profile but all the i was gonna say perhaps you're being paranoid but no there's no way right it's well, gotta be I, a grub 120tp <laughs> came over the other day and i don't know how those guys know where i live but i mean my village is hidden away. Like, you know, you wouldn't plan to go over that. And yeah, so I think it's a great thing. You know, I think it's great. I, I try and really do. I know people would say that I hit the Air Force a lot. 
I don't. I just believe as a veteran, um, what the Air Force does reflects on me. And as, as, as a veteran, I believe what I do reflects on the Air Force. And I just, you know, I've got a lot of time for all the services. I just talk about them. Yeah. Because young yeah. people contact me about going in, you yeah. know, and yeah. there's not many people that will speak to young people about joining the military. Because mm. it, it is a bit of a dream for a lot of people, not necessarily to be sort of... Uh, do sort of uh, combat sorties in a fast jet, but just to fly. Yeah, just, of course. For a lot of people, it's a sort of an almost an unrealizable dream. It's great. I say every day, yeah. I'm luckiest dude in the world. I fail my A levels, and I still got to fly jets. Now you can't fail fail your A levels nowadays. They they saw that loophole and changed it. But <laughs> um, but you know, I think I mean, I but your to, maths is up to snuff. I mean, yeah, there's no the question, maths, right? The maths I mean, is okay. yeah, the right. Maths, I mean, that's the main. The maths is good. I teach that now. Approximate and refine. I, I've got a method of teaching maths to pilots. Um, where we approximate and then as we go down, we refine the math. So big picture stuff, yeah. But um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I failed my A-levels and then went to university and did an H&D, um, scraped myself through it. I'm the most academic cat in the world, don't get me wrong. And then I did my degree. I got my 2-2, my Desmond, you know, and uh, <laughs> a solid drinking man's degree. And then um, joined the Navy and the Navy takes in waifs and straits. Um, the Air Force, in my opinion, at that time, I think things are different now. At that time, the Navy would look for um, look look at the individual over the academics. I think at that time the Air Force was the reverse. I think academics are very important to the Air Force. But you know, someone else has called me out on that and said a similar thing happened to them with the Air Force. So fair fair play. But yeah, I um, the Navy when I tried to join the Navy, they um, they said no. I got a really poor score, and they said you're lacking teamwork and um, what else was I lacking? Oh yeah, knowledge of the Navy. They said because I was doing my I do my degree at the same time, and my, my average interview board came up like a week after my degree, and because I'd failed everything academically, I thought let's prioritize academics just this once. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, just yeah. so I got a degree. Luckily, um, so I didn't know much about the Navy, so I went away. I learned everything about the Navy you could learn. Joined the Royal Navy Reserve, and I went and played rugby for Portsmouth, which is a stupid thing to do. Portsmouth fourth team. It's just a fight, basically, with a ball <laughs> right. somewhere. We used to have a ball, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. And, and then I went back to the uh, back to the AIB after six months. Um, they told me to go away for a year. Six months, my dad said, give them a call, see if there's, you know, see if they will see you. Because we lived in Portsmouth anyway. Gave them a phone call and they went, yeah, if you can be here in two days, you can come and interview again. And then I passed with a really high score this time. So it was mm. the biggest difference between a failure and a pass I think they'd seen in about a decade. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just did what they told me, right? All right. Yeah, so they, they told me to go and play a team sport and they told me to um, learn more about the Navy. I did just that. I think there's a lot to be said. I see a lot of young people contact me about um, them failing to get into the military the first time. That's normal. Like, I don't know many people that pass first time. And if you do, fair play to you. But the Navy, the, the military is just testing you. It's looking at you saying, well, you, you want to join us, right? Cool. Okay. You, you may be not just there yet. Come back and see us in a year's time. I reckon 80% of those people don't come back. So they're self-selecting. Right. The military hasn't got to look at them right. again. You know? So yeah. it's doing it on purpose. It's saying, let's see if you come back. And if you come back, we'll probably take you in. Mm -hmm. I tell that to young people. It's like revolutionary to them. It's like, oh, my mind is blown. Oh, <laughs> I can, I'm going to apply again, can I? Yeah, <laughs> apply again. <laughs> Journey doesn't stop here. You, you take it if you want it. You know what I mean? It's there for you. I've read a few stories about sort of a, again, special forces selection type stuff. And most of the guys don't get through first time. That's right, yeah. It's most of the time, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you mentioned something there about um, low level flying. I have to ask you about this because, uh, because the tornado was sort of one of the things it was kind of it was great. kind of famous for, yeah, right? I mean, that was, yeah. um, and in Gulf War One, yeah, uh, we flew loads of crazily low level. I mean, under two hundred and fifty feet, right? Yeah, it's silly. Uh, yeah. as, they, as had low no, as, they had no limit, so they went down to whatever they wanted to fly, right? So, and it was. Very extremely dangerous. They crash loads. Right. They crash loads. Right. So, but so just in and of itself, by definition, it's a dangerous thing to do, whether you're in an in enemy territory or not. And I see, uh, you know, there's plenty of videos of you on YouTube do, doing it for real, flying yeah. down the valleys and things. And I did ask you this in uh, our previous conversation, but I really want to ask you again um, about bird strikes. You yeah. mentioned about bird strikes, um, and just your 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 window of of uh, of having something terribly bad go wrong is quite big when you're down there, right? I mean, yes. you say you can eject at 400 odd knots. It's, it's not going to be any kind of fun. Mess you up. Yeah. Um, so my point is this. You're flying down the valley under 250 odd feet, 400 odd knots, whatever. How, like, how are you not petrified of a bird strike? Is, is, are you scanning for birds at all times? Is that mainly what you're doing? No, you don't normally have. You don't. Or do you just have to ignore it and just? Yeah. Just, well, just some, hope it's not going to happen to you. Right? Often, the worst thing you can do is react to a bird. If that makes sense, all right? Um, we used to have this thing in Scotland where, and sometimes someone will come back and say, "This valley is out of bounds for the next four weeks." 
Because what you'd have is like a nesting eagle or something in the valley. Eagles, their eyesight is is pretty cool, right? So they'd, they'd be in the nest sat there with the, like their baby eagles. And then they'd see a tornado, but they don't think it's a tornado. They, they think it's another bird coming into their valley because it's, it's tiny weenie, right? Tornado coming. And then they go leap off to have a go at this, what they think is a bird. And then by the time they realize it's a tornado, it's a bit late, big wings out. Normally you see the eagle going, ah, like this <laughs> shocked expression on its face. But what will always happen is a bird will always roll upside down and go down. It will always try and go down to the safety of the trees. Mm. So if I was to um, if I was to sort of bunt to, to avoid a bird, it may be doing the same thing and I'm just going to hit it. You see, and I've hit birds before that I've reacted to, but I've never hit a bird that I haven't reacted to, if that makes sense. Right. Right. So right. arguably my movement on my aircraft has caused impact with that bird. Birds are pretty clever dudes and and bird dudettes. And so they they understand the sky pretty well, right? I mean, they can they you know, they haven't got any licenses, but <laughs> you know, they don't fly in cloud, but apart from that, but they kind of know how to fly better than most pilots. So they're gonna look after themselves most of the time. Uh, I had one of my guys uh, hit a swan once, smashed the whole jet up. Um, his nose wheel undercarriage wouldn't come down, had to land it on the two wheels. And there was a hole in the bottom of the airplane where the swan had come and ripped the aircraft apart. So swans, he had to write a letter to the queen, by the way. She wrote back, yeah, it's all right. I've got some more. Um, don't worry about that one. You know, rather you save the jet. But um, yeah. So, so say one of the queen swans. Queen swan, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it can be, so if you hit a bird, you're looking at, um, you can feel it normally. Well, you, it makes a hell of a bang. Um, obviously windshield area, it can come into the cockpit through, you know, how this stuff works. I mean, there's, there's a small gap where the canopy comes down in between that and the front and it's, it's, uh, we inflate a seal around it and birds have come in through that surprising enough, huge bird strike damage. The Hawk has a screen between the front and rear occupants. So if the front canopy gets taken out, that blast deflector in effect should stop the bird coming into the rear cockpit as well. So hopefully there's one pilot still, you know, still conscious. Um, this is why I wear visors and everything else. But, you know, you, you deal with the emergency you get. So if you hit a bird, fine, let's just sit on the hands. Normally, if it's gone down the engine, the engine's going to be in surge because it's hit the compressor blades and thrown some of those down through the turbine. But the worst thing you can do is react to an emergency straight away. So if you if you do take a bird, especially if you think it's in the engine, you have to leave the throttle alone. Just don't even touch that thing because you can make it a lot worse if you demand power or take some power off, you know what I mean? So you leave the throttle alone. And then because we're doing 420 knots at low level, seven miles a minute, even if my engine destroys itself at that point, I can pull the jet back, nice light climb. I don't want to pull too far, but I can just climb it up about 30 degrees nose up and I'll reach about 8,000 feet. Now, if I need to shut my engine down and try and relight it, I wrote an essay on this because I had to do it. I've done it several times. I've got probably about two, maybe two minutes, maybe, yeah, maybe two minutes, maybe 90 seconds to deal with that emergency. And so I can work through the engine relight. If it's relighting and surge again, I can cut the fuel off again. I'll give it, let, let it cool down, right? Try it again. Uh, is there anything else I can do? You know, let's steer away from the orphanage and need the medals. You know what I mean? So don't drop, don't drop jets on orphanages. Although kids aren't worth as much. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know why we place so much in them, but they haven't done anything. Like, but um, yeah, don't, useless, useless, useless kids. <laughs> but put the jet in the sea rather than on a town. So you can steer the jet away and then jets tend to glide. Um, the heavier ones glide not as well as the lighter ones, but a hawk, would glide two miles for every thousand feet, for example. So sounds like quite a lot to me. Sounds yeah, like so two miles for a thousand feet. So if I'm at eight thousand feet, you know what I mean. I've got like sixteen mile glide range, so I can definitely take that jet away from populated areas, um, and then get yourself an upward vector, and then get out if you have to, you know. But you know what? Most jets you can bring back with bits falling off them. They're all right, <laughs> and um, you know, you declare an emergency, come home. Birds, you got to soak it up. You know, I almost flew into paraglider once, so um, oh. flew underneath a bunch of paragliders that were. Normally, they'd put a no time out, notice to airmen saying, we're paragliding on this hill, and it was on, on a target run. I went through a uh, leading with student behind me. He was about 10 seconds behind me. And uh, as I went through, we were supposed to pop for the attack. So we're going to pop, and then we're going to nose over, and then we're going to um, strike our target. And as I went for my pop at three miles, three and three or something miles, I always look up. So I'm about to pop, look up, and there's, there's just paragliders all over the place. <laughs> so I just said, stay low, mate. There's paragliders, and then you came through as well. He said, yeah, it's crazy. I was like looking up and there's just paragliders up there. I can <laughs> only imagine that was uh, uh, hundreds of times more frightening for them. They phoned us up afterwards. Right, yeah. Right. yeah, they said, they, what they, were you doing? Yeah, they were like, that was the scariest thing we've ever had in the world. <laughs> and I explained what I was about to do. And I would have gone straight. I would have smashed through them all. And um, oh, there had been bits of, oh, it had been horrendous. But they, they from then on, they said, uh, we'll, we're going to no tam every time we, we paraglide. It's a, it was a phone call, no tam. I think now you can do it on a PC. You just, if you're a paraglider, you just literally, I think you can just, Go on to the no town place, wherever that is, and just tell people where you're going to be flying. It saves you being killed, you know? Right, it's, a, yeah. it's a good thing about it. So, so that's interesting that you said you have had bird strikes, but yeah. I've, you've also said to me before you've never ejected. No. So it was never an ejection situation. No. 
But you did t- tell me once an anecdote about a friend of yours who did have to eject, and he obviously lost the jet. Yes. And um, and the interesting story that he had to go to um, the hospital with, um, what was it, with the... Oh, no, he ended up... They cut his clothes off Oh, of he's him, naked, yeah. And he ended up having to go to Tesco's yeah, like, yeah, half yeah. naked or something. Yeah, naked, yeah. So and he went from a fighter pilot, and a few hours later, he's half naked in Tesco's. He's half naked in Tesco's, <laughs> buying himself the cheapest trousers and, and shirt he can find. I think he had to go in his hospital gown. He had nothing. And he, uh, he literally was in Tesco's, like, like walking around like this. Yeah, by himself. No one came to get him. He um he was a Harrier mate, actually. He's a really good dude. He's still it's flying. It's no joke to eject. It's a traumatic thing. Oh, right? he should have been I mean... killed. There was no two ways about it. Um, he should have been killed. He knows he should have been killed. Uh, what he did was it was an error. It was a mistake he'd made. Um, the jet departed flight very low to the ground, very slow. He actually pulled the handle when he was upside down. And it obviously takes a quarter of a second for the seat to leave the airplane. And in that time, the aircraft had just come around to give him a positive vector. God. So as the chute was opening, the jet exploded and actually landed on a car that was unoccupied at the time. Um, it was a police car, actually, it was unoccupied at the time. So you can imagine that. You're like, oh, I'm going to jail. I'm going to-. <laughs> and, uh, and he actually said when he was in his parachute coming down, he's like watching this fireball and he actually starts pulling the parachute array so he could actually turn away from it. <laughs> and it was a brand new jet. I mean, literally, the God. jet had been delivered a couple of weeks before. God. Uh, super expensive. So they put him in hospital and um, I think – the boss came down and he straight away put his hand up and said, he was quite a new pilot on that squadron. And he said, boss, it's my fault. He said, I, I, it's my fault. This is what, I, it's what I did. The boss was like, don't worry. We'll, we'll talk about it. Don't worry. We'll talk about it. <laughs> and uh, he was like, oh God. Anyway, no one brought him anything. And then two days later, he was released or whatever. They've got to check you out for spinal compression injuries. Mm. He was quite a short dude anyway. So, <laughs> uh, you know, if anything, we're trying to stretch him out. And um, yeah, he, 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 he had no clothes because all, all the rescuers had, um, Cut everything off him, cut his G pants off him, his life vest, his flight suit, his thermal underwear, everything had come off him. It's not very glamorous being a jet pilot, you know. My wife, <laughs> my wife tries to tell everyone about all the thermal underwear I wear and stuff like that. And uh, <laughs> so he had nothing, he had, his, he had his gown. And the hospital said, Well, we haven't got anything, um, but you know, I can drop you at a Tesco's. And they did. And he's running around Tesco's in this hospital gown, <sighs> buying some cheap clothes and stuff, you know. I mean, that's a, it's, it's mad, isn't it? How you used, well, Playing with, I imagine, hundredth of a second, not even tenth of a second between... Uh, he was lucky. Yeah, he it, knows it was. It, between, as you say, that angle where he's not going to be ejecting into the ground or something. Yeah, I he mean, didn't, uh, that's not a conscious choice he made. He just uh, he pulled the handle. Um, the jet departed and God. he just got himself out. He was so low. He was in the circuit at the time in, in a Harrier. Um, and he was making an approach and he moved the wrong nozzle. And it, well, the Alpha went up, the jet departed, and he just straight away went out. Gosh. And it just so happened that he was just lucky enough to not fire himself into the ground. He, he didn't have a choice. I mean, he, he can't time an ejection like that. When the jet departs that late, that slow, that low, uh, you just got to try and get out. And uh, you, it's irrecoverable, irrecoverable from that point. Have you ever had, uh, or, or what's the situation that sp- first springs to mind if I ask you, if you've ever had a situation where you're like, oh, I, I might be dead in the next few seconds here. Oh, uh, well, I've gone for the handle twice. Um, really? With, with, both with students. Both my my own area, really. I should have. Were the students flying? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Um, I haven't had one where I've actually I've relit a few engines in my time, but no, I've never gone for the handle on a salt. The thing is, if you go for the handle, by definition, you take your hands off the stick, because if you're trying to save an aircraft, what tends to happen is you've normally got full power on, or, or you've normally got the stick fully off because you're trying to get away from the ground. That's pretty much what it is. And so your ejection handle is behind the stick. You can't pull it because the stick is up against it. So you've got to release that pressure to get to the handle. And if you are keeping an aircraft flying by keeping the stick back, as soon as you release it, the nose of the jet comes down. Now you've got a rate of descent issue. Ejection seats won't save you from everything. Right. So if you've got a rate of descent, I could do the math right now. That's um, 10% of the height in effect. So I'm at 800 feet. Or, well, let's do 1,000 feet, whatever. But um, I've got a rate of descent, say 100 foot per minute. I could be outside my my ejection seat envelope. So when we see, if anyone knows the, the practice force landing profiles, the Hawk does, when it's coming down very, very steep, that guy's outside his ejection seat envelopes. If he doesn't recover that aircraft at the right time, he is irrecoverable. So he's well outside, well outside. And um, so you, it's a gamble with a seat. The F-35 seat is a lot better than uh, most seats. Typhoon's got a pretty good seat. Tornado was a reasonably old seat. Hawk is a reasonably dated seat, but it's always quite. A, it's always been a decent seat. Uh, mm. Some of the American stuff, some of the Russian stuff is pretty cool. But yeah, um, and my ones were like, um, in fact, I had a guy send me something from Valley a couple months ago who was, I won't say who the dude is because that will give him away, but he made a mistake. He was an instructor in the back of a jet and a, a student um, did something on landing and he went for his handle, but he was well outside limit. So he went for the handle and realized you'll kill them both. So 
All right. So yeah. you may as well ride it out, and you might. Yeah, you might. Be okay. get, you might get away with the jet God. hitting the ground at 150 mile an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. but yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're definitely going to be killed if he left the aircraft when he went for the handle. He would have been killed. All right. Because, you know, again, if the, if we always try and say you get a positive vector away from the ground with the wings level. That's the deal, with the wings level. If you're banked over a little bit and you're too close to the ground, the, the seat's going to come out. The parachute's going to try and open, but you, you haven't got the height, you know. And sometimes the faster you are, the better you are because the parachute needs to inflate behind you. Uh, and if you're really slow, the parachute will inflate, but it needs you to be going down sometimes to inflate that parachute. So landing incidents uh, with ejections are always difficult. You know, right. always, um, but you know, it's, it doesn't normally happen. I mean, students make mistakes yeah. and, um, are you not pissed off with them after like you, you nearly oh, killed I would, have, I would have killed half my instructors probably as a student as well. <laughs> I mean, the, the problem is as an instructor, sometimes you get complacent and your hands aren't where they need to be, which is just, just shadowing the stick and throttle, not touching them. Students get a lot of experience. You end up trusting students a lot and then they make a mistake. And sometimes your hands are up here because you're relaxing as an instructor in the back seat. And sometimes I almost killed an instructor once when I was trying to demonstrate what students do. Uh, and I put the aircraft into a position, I still remember now, um, where I put the aircraft on landing into an almost irrecoverable position. And, and I'd actually got my, um, and this is a lesson for people that are instructing, I'd actually set my training instructor up in the back. He, was, he has to pretend to teach me as an experience. He's teaching me, as, I'm pretending to be a student, basically. I'm pretending to be a student. But you've got to be a very experienced instructor to, to pretend to be a student. And I was an experienced instructor. I hadn't made this mistake before, though, and I did. And in the circuit, I was landing my aircraft long, so a little bit further down the runway each time. We try and land on the numbers for the runways at the very beginning. I was landing it long. I was being a pretend to be a student that was like floating the aircraft on, being a bit fast and landing a bit down the runways to get him to, to talk me back on. The whole point, he has to say, mm -hmm. let's try and bring the touchdown point closer to the to end of the runway, because then we've got time to stop if we have to, whatever. We always try and land on the early part of the runway. And so I wanted him to tell me to, to do that, to, to bring that back. And he did tell me. He told me really late in the approach. So what I did is push the nose down. And of course, what happens is I, I then affect a, a massive rate of descent on the aircraft when the aircraft is also slow speed and I haven't got the control authority to be able to recover it. I thought I was, but the nose went down. And immediately I remember thinking, no, you've done this. And I put the power on and I, I brought the stick back. And we literally just, we, we must have missed the ground by like 20 feet or something. When the gear wasn't down. Yeah, we were all configured, but we would have smashed that jet up. Right. Like, no two ways about it. Um, yeah, yeah we, we were in a really bad place. What was that, a tornado? You no, that was a Hawk. Right. That was a T1. And afterwards I got out of the jet and I said, I made that mistake. Like, dude, 110%. Because I remember him in the back was like, um, I remember there was like a, a gasp of air in the back. <laughs> But it was the whole point was I was trying to get across to him. If you tell a student to bring that touchdown point earlier, he will, he will do that, and he's he doesn't realize doing that is going to cause it. I didn't, you know, I didn't do it like a student would do it because a student would fly into the ground. Uh, but that was the whole point was that student will do some crazy things in that airplane that mm -hmm. you've never seen before. Like you know, right. you've never seen. You know, I did a crazy thing that I'd never really done before either. But that was the whole point was trying to get the lesson across. And uh, from then on, his hands were like on the control. Like, you know, so <laughs> it's yeah. like that thing. I've heard people, um, uh, race car drivers, motorbike racers, uh, people even that, that, that do climbing. Uh, I was I was watching a thing, a documentary about um, free climbers the other day, and they say sometimes they say things like, um, you know, it's a calculated risk. You're, yeah. It's like risk management. Yeah, risk it's, management. It's yeah. an exercise in risk management. Yeah, yeah. But they say things like, at this moment, if things go awry, at this moment. Uh, it, it's bad. So, for example, I've heard people say, um, uh, I'm, you know, climbing a rock face and everything's okay. But if my grip just right now there, there's nothing. You'd say it's irrecoverable. So yeah. it's an irrecoverable position. You see, um, I've heard even F1 drivers say that it's all well and good, but a particular apex of a particular corner, mm. if you lose the back or whatever it is there, it, you're done. And so it's in your mind a lot. And I wonder just if it, that must happen, like you say, when you, you realise, you know, you've got all the experience to know that if something goes wrong in this little window, yeah. there's not really anything that can be done. And so yeah. my question, I suppose, is, is that something that uh, prevents you from uh, performing at the best, at your best? Or is it, I mean, is it something that affects you or do you have to ignore that, essentially ignore it? Because, you know, like a race driver, you've got to ignore that that's a very, very dangerous apex. And he's got to take it at race speeds. Yeah. Is it the same in a, in a fast jet? Well, you've just got to ignore that. Well, that. Yeah. sometimes you die. You know, let's be honest. Sometimes you die. You, you Hopefully you won't. And you do everything you can to mitigate against it. Um, 
you know, I think we had a chat last time where I said, I knew better pilots, better pilots than me died. And uh, that's hard to go to work the next day when you know the dude, you know, you, you always hear it. Someone will say, did you hear what happened on 25 Squadron or something? And you're like, no, what's going on? Well, they've just lost a jet. Well, are there any fatalities? Yeah, there's two. And you're like, normally you don't carry on flying that day because um, if, a jet, if a jet crashes on your own station, you stop flying because it could be fuel contamination, right? So everyone just stops flying. Everyone comes, brings the jets back. Um, I've never lost a jet on a squadron I was on. I'm kind of fortunate, but I've lost a jet on the station I was on. And... Um, and I've left stations and then a jet has crashed. It's the weirdest thing. It's like, seriously? But uh, so, yeah. So if, if you, some, you know, people just, people die and that's just what it is. And I had a lot of friends or people I knew who were better pilots than me that, that, that died. And all of them were in, in control of the airplane when they were killed. There was none, you know, uh, uh, they were all in control of the airplane. That was the thing. So you, you then go to work thinking, well, he was better than me and he still died. So, but you, you just go to work and you, you, it's a very professional attitude everyone has and you talk it through and you go flying again. Um, people carry on flying. You try and work out why. That's always a bonus. If you can work out why he died, then you can not make the mistakes again. But um, yeah, I think that's one of those things. But yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're, you'll have to, sometimes it's going to be your turn and you just try and make it not. Risk management is, is how I would describe that role as well as a pilot. You're a risk manager because, you know, yeah, sometimes you're going to get shot in the face with a missile or whatever when you're, you know, or some. It's just one of those things. And you try and do everything you can to make sure it's not you. That's mm. the thing. And that's what the training's for. So, yeah, it's... Uh, Have you ever been training someone and they've done something absolutely ridiculous? And you've been, uh, you know, like... How have you got this far in the training, and you still think that was an okay thing to do, or where they go to do something, and you realise that's that's yeah, bad, and you have to yeah. stop them? Students will do that because students are learning, and you don't hold it against a student. I wouldn't even fail the trip normally, depending on what it is, because if you fail the trip, you've got to fly it again, and there's a confidence issue and everything else. We don't want to do that. So if if we get learning value out of it, that's great. Let's look at the tape, look at the flight tape, right. and we we get the student and debrief. And what I try to foster when I left was a really open, honest culture. You know, and I'd do that by even coming back from a trip and pretending I'd make some mistakes so that the students would open up that more. I mean, sometimes an instructor would come back in and he'd say, uh, you know, I'd have my student in my jet. There'd be another instructor in another jet because you tend to fly in pairs or, or threes, especially on the more advanced stuff. And an instructor would come back in and he'd say, um, can, can you bring up some, some errors you might have done or whatever? Sure. Yeah, he's made a few mistakes. And I want him to bring them up himself. I want to see if he's seen the mistakes, and if he's going to be All honest right. about them. All right. Students know they're clever, and uh, so I'd I'd start off by going right safety points because that's what the first thing you talk about in the debrief is aim and safety, and I'd say right so I I missed a fuel call uh, I didn't tell you what my fuel was and that's really bad because you don't know then and therefore you don't know when we should be going home and and I, I did this as well I missed this radio call here uh, right any safety points from yourself now a good student will come up with some safety points like they would say I, yeah I did this wrong a student who is um, maybe struggling. Maybe you'll hide a few things. Well, I think they can hide a few things if they can. An instructor, will, an instructor might prompt them then, what about when this happened? They'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I did this. So they're not doing it um, nefariously. There's no bad intent. But they they sometimes maybe forget things because it's in the jet. It's a busy place. You do forget things. But that's how we try to encourage like an open sort of culture. But, yeah, students – Students would do some silly things. I did silly things as a student as well. It's what we don't find happening in, in the Royal Air Force, I never saw it once, and I'm honest about this. I'll be talking to you about it. I never saw anyone, I never saw a nefarious intent with an airplane. The level of professionalism is so high. Um, you're so self-regulated as well, because who's going to regulate a jet pilot, right? A team of, a squadron of jet pilots, who's going to come in and tell you you're doing anything wrong? It's like me going to a special forces unit. I know nothing about special forces. Who regulates special forces units? Other special forces guys. Right. That's who does it. Right. So, you know, who does that? We do get, checked out by something called Central Flying School. And these are very senior guys come over and just say, just having a look at you guys, making sure you, everything's cool, you know, and that's pretty good. Um, and my job was to try and regulate flying. I never really saw any poor flying on on any squadron I was on. And people will call me out on this and I'll be like, well, define what poor flying is. Poor flying would be breaking rules intentionally. And I never saw anyone fly too low intentionally. Yeah, they set the rat out bug off, the, the radar altimeter warning bug a few times. I do that all the time because you're trying to be at that height and the bug's only set for 10% less than the height you're trying to be at, at 250 feet. You set it off two or three times in a saucy. That's probably a bit too much, but you know, once or twice it's, it's going to happen. And um, students will do that. And uh, yeah, I never saw anyone fly under a bridge or, I mean, you'd be chucked <laughs> out for that kind, of, that kind of shit. You know, you, you can't do that. And also, by the way, you're on the, on the squadron, a pilot's behavior reflects on the other pilots on that squadron. So if I'm being a dick, they're going to look like dicks as well. 
And if that guy's being a dick, all we can do is take him to the bar and smash him up. You know what I mean? So <laughs> nothing like a bit of violence on the squad. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't think that stuff's done anymore. That's it. Well, one question I wanted to ask you is something you said to me once before, and I didn't have a chance to sort of uh, drill down a little bit into it, where you said, we're talking about actual um, combat, when, you're, when, you're, when your tornadoes uh, got laden with bombs. Yeah. And things. Um, you spoke about the tornado as though it were... Um, uh, like a lorry that just delivers bombs to a battlefield and then bugs out and you're protected by screens of, um, uh, you know, air attack. I hope I am, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so my question is this really, that people that I guess don't really know too much or not that familiar, they would think of as a, a tornado as just simply a, a fighter jet. But it's not exactly that, right? I mean, well, not first and foremost. It's more like a, a weapons delivery well, it's a bomber. Uh, so, it, right, so, yeah. right. So it's a fast jet, but it's a bomber. It's not a fighter. It was designed primarily, I think it was called the MRCA, multi role Combat Aircraft. So, it, okay. it, But it, it was really good at low-level weapons weapons delivery. So AI, airborne interdiction. So finding a target. I mean, it was stationed in Germany, remember, initially, um, in, in the big bases over there, when we had all the tornadoes over there. And they were supposed to go across drop bombs or buckets of instant sunshine and then Hopefully you make it home, but you might not. You might have the fuel for it. That was the idea of the tornado when it first came in. And then it became a fighter in the F2, then the F3, which is what it was. And it, it was more of an interceptor because it didn't. It's, it's not very good at doing close-in fighting. So it was interceptor, go up and launch a big missile, and then come down again. Um, but it was it was really great. It was fast at the low-level roll, and you could hang a lot on it. And it looked cool. It had wings that moved and, you know, fire out the back. And all that kind of. So, yeah, uh, um, it's just like a soldier. A soldier is a carrier of a weapon system to a battlefield. His weapon system happens just to be a rifle. And my weapon system happened to be, say, four 1,000-pounders or maybe a paveway three or four or whatever with a with a targeting pod, um, maybe brimstone, uh, anything like anti-armor, anything like that. And the I was fortunate when I got into the squadron I was on. It just transitioned from a maritime strike squadron. And trying to attack ships is a really stupid idea. Chips are really well defended um, and they know you're trying to attack them. So, you know, it's just dumb. So we then, we were transitioned into a low-level strike squadron and right. uh, we were one of uh, three up at Lossy, I believe, at the time. It was seven, 14 nice. Nice. And then there was the OC, the Operational Conversion Unit, where you learned to fly the aeroplane. They were on our side of the airfield as well. So the sorties I always did were low-level four ships, so four aircraft, uh, all-weather, night stuff, um, train following radar, night vision goggles, that kind of stuff, in the valleys of Scotland. Um, yeah, yeah as you know four aircraft trying to hit the target and yeah things would we'd have people trying to come and shoot us down simulated and um surface missile systems as well would try and illuminate us and we'd have to hide from those but that's that's what they're flying that's the flying i wanted to do that was just yeah. that doesn't happen anymore right. i mean everything now is medium level stuff uh which it's great don't get me wrong the aircraft are super complex are super complicated and they are they're great airplanes, F-35, I think Typhoon, all these kind of aircraft that are around at the moment. F-22, stunning, stunning. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. so the, it's a different game and it's one that I'm happy not necessarily to be in now because I like the old school rolling around the hills with big GR kind of stuff, you know? And being alive is a bonus, isn't yeah, it, it's usually? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, I, I think we spoke last time, didn't we, about coming out of the military and doing some work on transitioning. And I think I've mm. done a lot of that work now. And to be fair, to go back in, you're kind of wired pretty tight in there. And uh, I'm kind of happy not to be. Mm. Yeah, um, no, I remember you saying that. You've saying made videos even, about the transitioning yeah, I try to, out yeah, and I try stuff. to. I try to help. So I imagine that. if it's been your, say, it's like a, a type of childhood dream. It's been your career for decades. Yeah. And it's sort of all you've uh, thought about and lived and breathed, and suddenly it's just uh, over yeah. for whatever reason. And uh, well, yeah, I can, I can only imagine it must be really difficult. But um, like I say, you've, you've got loads of things going on. I was, there's one thing I want to ask you: is it must be, is it a bit annoying that people sort of constantly go on about? It? I think of like maybe a band that had a great number one years ago and at every gig they go to forevermore they everyone just wants to hear that song that song yeah and it must be frustrating uh, you know, a little bit or, or or no well i try i try to, about that. yeah I, I i try to transition away from defense i tried to yeah. obviously defense is your skill set isn't it so most of my colleagues they either went out to saudi to carry on flying i didn't want to do that um well, it's, for the Saudi military? Yeah, so they, they train Saudi students out there. Right, all right. We used to train Saudi students back in the UK as well. So it's just they went out on a civilian contract to train Saudis. And they're good dudes. And at the time when I left the military, it wasn't a great place really. And it got better and it's better. And they've made it better. The men, I think it's all, more men than went out there, have made it better, taking the families out there. And they built a good school out there from what I hear. And it's great. And they make some good money. 
I don't want to go to Saudi. I don't want to do that. I like the UK. I like the rain. I like the mornings. You know, I like the I like people. I like, you know, I like where we are. Okay. I live in a beautiful village and it's a lovely place. So I don't want to be in Saudi. I mean, you wake up one morning with cancer and you, what have you done for a lot? You know, that's how I feel about yeah. it. It's like, come on. You might want a bacon sandwich and a pint of beer. Yeah, come on. Sure, come on. <laughs> I'm not throwing that away. If I go right, to Saudi, yeah. <laughs> even making millions of dollars. You Priorities, know, so. too. Priorities. All right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the transition is, is difficult. And, you know, I, Fast Shape Performance is, um, I do, uh, I'm an aviation consultant. I do a lot of work um, within defense, with individual companies. I also work with, with men a lot. Uh, I don't tend to work with women that much. I have in the past, but men contact me. We do work on that. And I uh, and I, I run my, my sim as well now. So I run my flight school. And uh, the flight school is growing. All the lessons that I learned in the military, I give to these people. I've got airline pilots in there, light aircraft pilots, rotary mates in there. I've got guys in IT. I've got women. Uh, one of the women in there is, um, she flies for a Middle Eastern airline. So she's a first officer on that. She flies with us. She's very, very good, actually. Very good. She just keeps herself on one aircraft and she just nails it. You know, she's just studying this thing and she's just showing the guys up. It's embarrassing, <laughs> but, um, and it's great because people get a lot out of it, you know? So yeah, there's a lot of things, but it's hard to get away from that background because it was 20 years of your life. And I feel I'm very fortunate to have that. So to be able to take the lessons from that and to help people with that is, and I tell you what, every month someone writes to me and says that they've read one of my essays and it either stopped them killing self or it was it improved their marriage. And you know what? They're just up there. They're just, essays on a website you know and uh if you can if you can do that you can you can write something or make a video that helps people i mean i'm sure your stuff helps people all this stuff here hopefully i mean yeah people yeah. must write stuff to you and say you know thank you for putting that out because occasionally know, yeah it's a crazy world out <laughs> yeah. there sometimes isn't it? that's it yeah i mean i think it's great stuff i i honestly do think a couple of different things there your flight's going sort of the the help with guys i mean it's yeah. great stuff i mean there's not enough people out there doing sort of proactive proactively positive things yeah, it's um, um, so when I left as well, I'll be, be fair with you. When I left, I, I probably had the wrong skin color, to be fair. Um, I actually, there was a company and I won't mention the name. I probably should, but I won't. And they they actually asked me to apply for a job. And uh, there wasn't many people that could do this job, shall we say. I don't want to say what the job was. It would mean a, a move or a long commute anyway. So I was a bit kind of, I didn't really want to do it. The money was pretty good. And they said, um, I put an application in, I put an application. In. So I did, I put an application. In. And you put an application, in, right? I didn't have to take the job. And then they... And the guy who asked me was a guy I knew used to be a, a instructor of mine. And then he phoned me up and he said, Tim, I can't get back to you with this job for about six months. Because if you look at the front page of our website, at the very bottom, it says, um, uh, we particularly welcome applications from women and uh, ethnic minorities. Or I think they use the term BAME, which I don't use because it's a derogatory term. What were they doing? They use that term. And uh, I said, well, what did you ask me to apply for? They went, no, we, the, the company's big into this now. Just, we, you know, I'm not saying everyone agrees with it, but big into it. Just I'll call you in six months. So I had no money or nothing. So I, um, and I wasn't a woman and I, I, I unfortunately had white skin. So uh, that crime. So I had to start teaching people. And uh, that's when I started teaching the odd person to fly in this sim. I was doing work with men anyway as well. So it was all right. And by the time they came back to me in six months and they said, strangely enough, we can't find anyone who is <laughs> like, yeah. no, you can't because I trained most of them and they're, they're still flying jets. So uh, I, I turned off, turned down the offer. And, uh, and then, you know what, I was chatting to someone else about this the other day and I went back to that website. I went back to that website when I was chatting to this dude, they've taken that shit down now. Right. They've taken it off. Right. So, you know, it was a, it was a fad they were going through yeah. and, uh, I guess they missed out on guys like myself, not saying it's not a bad thing, <laughs> probably wrong fit for, for their company. But yeah, when I left, it was that time it was peak, you know, woke. I guess. And, uh, I, th I think you were out of order for being white, really. I think yeah. you should have. <laughs> Don't you, you start to, that. You need no. to check yourself, I, I think, a bit there. My, my privilege or something, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Um, well, that leads us, I've got so, so many questions I'd love to ask you about flying and aviation or fast jets. But I get, unfortunately, uh, maybe we can have you back another time. Yeah, it's, sure. Uh, I'd road, love no, to pick far. your brain for hours and hours on end. But we do have to move on to... Like this stuff, like the sort of the wokeness in the RAF and the culture wars in the RAF yeah. and all sorts of things. Because it was in the news cycle uh, last week, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, all about the, the, the sort of the came down from up on high, the senior echelons of the RAF that they wanted, at least just for uh, a sort of front office, front showing people to yeah. be ideally not male or white. And that they yeah. tried to backtrack on it, but that was a, a half ass. It wasn't a real backtrack. And so, yeah. You just want to talk to me a little bit about the culture what's going on there okay really? well a lot of people write to me all the time i put up on my on fast performance on a facebook page or on the on youtube 
I probably talk about 5% of what I'm saying, okay? Because a lot of it's personal grievances between people and, and I'm not into doing that kind of stuff. But when someone, when a lot of people send me the same thing, I know the service is being affected by it. And it's not just the, the RAF. It's, it does seem to be more mm -hmm. so the RAF. The Navy have gone through a bit of a wave, but that died out, you know, the flying the the rainbow flag on a warship type thing. Mm. And they kind of stopped that, you know. Mm. Uh, the army um, don't seem to be that invested in it, although I do have an issue with with some army officers. Uh, and the reason I do is because they seem to be very virtue signally. And you know, and I know why that's the case. And it's been explained to me before. And it comes out of their, their training um, in, in Sandhurst. Fine, happy with that. 99% uh, of people are decent. But there are some people in the services that see an opportunity, I think, to to jump onto the latest bandwagon and to drag that stuff in. I think what's happened in the Royal Air Force is that that has happened. I think Stonewall came in. Um, they, they um, obviously there's a, an LGBT um, sort of court, which Stonewall insists you have, of course, within the Royal Air Force. It's led by um, the guy called Andy Turner, who is a good dude. Don't get me wrong. He's a good dude. Uh, he's recently famous for running around his garden naked. I know you know that, but um, that was fine. You should be able to run around. You're not. I'm going to do that as well. I, I, we don't spend enough time <laughs> naked in garden. But he he is he was the uh, LGBT champion in the Royal Air Force. Andrew so. Turner. Andrew Turner. Yeah, yeah. He's a good dude. He's a he's a road team mate. You know, he's all right. And um, but he was suspended from the Air Force. He's a two IC of the Air Force. So he was suspended. Now Mike Wigston. So Mike Wigston, who was my boss when I was on twelve, and again he's a he's a great guy. He did a report into bullying called the Wigston Report. And I think with that, he then came in and saw that as his as his lead, you know, as his, right, that's my thing. So then All he right. came in and said, we've got to celebrate diversity. What is diversity anyway? Uh, I'll tell you how I know I like this place. I walk in, I look at the books around here. I own half of them myself, which means we're talking to each other, of course. You know, you've got Douglas Murray's book over there. You've got um, Thomas Sowell over there. I mean, it's, you know, all these books, you know, it's like my own library in here. Mm -hmm. I wish some people would read some of these books sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. It should be like mandated reading, just... It's not difficult, is it? Just just read these books. Well, Lotus Eaters do book clubs there we go. various things. There we go. Uh, it's you on the should. website. Check out you the website. should. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. This is how we enlighten ourselves. And uh, so he's dragged this stuff through. And I think within the military, there are some elements that have really bitten into this. Um, so the pronouns in the bio thing were, was a big thing for me. I think that's a cult. Okay, we we do this in 10 years' time. We put pronouns in bio. And I had one of the guys I was chatting to on Twitter. Um, why am I? Why on Twitter am I doing this? Because uh, I was a fight but like fight, you know what I mean? Fight but right? Um, why not? But he was saying, uh, this 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 guy was saying, look, I put pronouns on my uh, my signature uh, footer at the bottom, whatever, because um, his name was I think Stuart Roxbury or something, and he was um he was an officer in the Air Force, I believe, or maybe the Navy. He said because I sometimes sign my emails Roxy, and people don't know whether I'm a girl or a boy. And I said, well, you know, God forbid you might be professional and actually sign it Stuart. You know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah. like, we're we'll stopping an idiot, mate. We're not yeah, 15 years old, right, are we? Yeah. You're in the military. Yeah. Sign it Stuart or or whatever your, your name is, you know, Lieutenant Roxbury or whatever it is, you know? It's that kind of thing. And that obviously blew his mind that he, you know, it's like, oh, that's an interesting point. It's like, yeah, stop being a dick, mate. Come on, you know, just, just sign it. Um, and, and I got another one as well. A, a lady said, well, my name's Joe and sometimes people think I'm a guy. You know, you don't explode, do you? You yeah. know what I mean? Just, yeah. Yeah. just. So now they've stopped addressing emails as sir and mom because you're assuming someone's gender if you do that. Apparently, it's a, it's a bloody military. And who even cares? I know. Right? Well, you, no one cares, but it's a way that you can become, you can be that victim. And I think people like being a victim nowadays, don't they? It's easier to be a victim than it is actually go out and pick a weight up or, oh, or get a job. Oh, it's the easiest thing or, in the world to yeah. claim you're offended. Exactly. I don't care if you're offended. Be offended. Yeah. I think Douglas Murray says that. You take offense. I don't care. When yeah. do we stop? You know what I mean? So um, it, it's just it's just weakness that's permeating society, I think, to a certain mm. extent. And, mm. and I, I personally, I hate it. And the fact it's got into the service that I was in 15 years, it's, it's, it's greatly upsetting. What that thing you referred to was, was an email that someone sent from a, a, an outer office. And... Um, I think what happened is Paramount had said to the Royal Air Force, even though it's a Navy film, they said to the Royal Air Force, uh, do you want to send some pilots down here to stand around a mock-up typhoon, which they had at the premiere of Tom Cruise? And uh, the Air Force, um, unfortunately, um, decided, wouldn't it be great to show diversity out there because we've only got 2.5% ethnic minorities within the service, which is lower than the army, but the army goes out all over the world, doesn't it? And recruits from different nations. And that's how they get their diversity uh, one up. And the, the Navy is a bit better on that. But of course, if you're the boss of the Air Force, you've got 2.5%. The other chiefs are saying, well, we're better than you, mate. You know what I mean? And the government did have targets, by the way, to, to bring more ethnic minorities in to the military. They haven't it's got a targets conservative now. government. Yeah, the targets were met, so they haven't officially got targets now, but they did have targets. Mm. And the Royal Air Force have said, um, 
the Royal Air Force said, well, we want to be 30%, 30% um, ethnic minority by, I think it's 2025 20, or something like that. My argument is, I think it might be 20% ethnic minority and 30% women. And all you've got to do is ask why. Why? why? Yeah, why? 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 How is, is that best? It's a meritocracy. So now you, and of course, the best people may be within these cohorts. I'm not denying that whatsoever. But the issue with the email was the the young lady, um, well, I assume she was, she's called Sarah. I'm assuming she was a young lady, but you never know nowadays. Do you? Didn't have her pronouns down there, unfortunately. So I couldn't really tell. So I'm sorry if I'm offending her. But um, she had, she'd written, uh, she, assuming they'd written, um, yeah, preferably, she said, oh, I, need, um, so I need a pilot to attend this event, preferably a, uh, not a white male. And that was sent to me by, I think, about 25, 30 different people just flood in. Mm -hmm. I normally try and validate this before. I've got some contacts still in the service. I've got a lot of contacts. So I, I wrote to someone quite senior and I said, I'm going to whack this out on a video. And he's like, yeah, we thought you would. And he's, <laughs> he's calling the gang. He's like, yeah, dude, you know, nothing we can do about it. And I said, can you just tell me it's real? And he said, yeah, it came from whatever office it came out of. Um, and uh, so I did a video about it. And rightly so, because there's 84% of the Royal Air Force, that is a white man. Mm. And you're, so my argument being, if you're going to be inclusive, you've got to be inclusive of everyone. And yeah, mm. I, you know, I'm called names for this and stuff. I, I, someone, someone the other day, on, it happened again on LinkedIn, a friend of mine, Joe, he's very serious. He's very senior in the military. He's very senior in the Air Force. He's a great person. She put a pitch up on LinkedIn saying, so privileged to work with a great bunch of uh, people. Um, and there was there was no white man in that picture. It was you know there was black and Asian Sikh and all that kind of stuff. And then and her as a white woman, and it was actually it, there was no context to the picture. You see, so you think she's saying great to work with grunts. And all I said was, Joe, you need a white man in there. Well, if you're going to be inclusive, put a white dude in. That's what I'm saying. It mm. doesn't. I mean, you've got everyone else. You know what I mean? Just put. A, then you would be inclusive, surely. Right. Yeah. But if you don't have a white man in there, you're not. <clears throat> no, you're quite right. I think that the idea of inclusivity or, div or diversity. Um, it's a it's a trick. They don't want diversity. I th I feel like diversity is code for less white people. It's as simple as that. It's not diverse, as you say. You end up with a picture where there's no no yeah. no yeah. white men at all. I mean, how perverse is that? So it's not diversity. In fact, you're talking about something else. Well, as Thomas Sowell says about diversity, is like that's the most nonsensical word in, in, in right, the world. It barely what it, means what anything, does it? Mean does it? Uh, and also, the other great way. thing about diversity, and I don't want to be that kind of white guy going, we mustn't be diverse because I've got loads of, well, I'm that guy, going, I've got a black friend, crikey, I'm that, you know, that guy, aren't I? But I don't see, I don't see a problem. On my flight sim, by the way, I've never seen a single face of any single person on there. I was chatting with a dude the other day. But it's a true meritocracy then. Well, of course it well, is. And that's the best thing, yeah, well, no? I mean, you know, and sometimes a guy will go, with that? oh yeah, I, and you're, a guy will send you a picture. Um, I got sent a picture of an airline pilot. I have seen one. And he was uh, uh, an Egyptian guy. Been flying with a guy for years. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother him. It didn't bother anyone. Was it? Why, why would it? Yeah. We're making it bother something. So we're making right. it an issue, aren't we? Or people are, because they're just race grifters, aren't they? That, <laughs> right, that, right. It's right. the stellar creases of this world that want to be bringing something in about nothing and, you know, right. talking about women can have a penis and it's all that kind of stuff. I don't, but they've got to be doing it for a reason. I don't even want to talk about stellar creases because you guys did a great video on that recently and I watched that and I thought that was, that was superb. So yes, I did a piece on that. Um, the Air Force, again, actually held their hands up to it and said, yeah, it's hit us inside the Air Force as well. That doesn't do us any good whatsoever. Mm. It actually puts us back. It makes us look like idiots. Mm. And actually, I think Paramount withdrew the invite because of the bad publicity. Right. So they think Carol Vorderman was there instead with a top open. You know, <laughs> like, you know, so that doesn't do them any good, does it? Because you, know, you saw the film. You've seen yeah, the new... I've seen uh, that, yeah. Was it any good? Yeah, it's all no true. Alert, all please, all but... true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Spoilers alert. No, no, it's... um The film, the film is a... Great. I think it's someone someone labelled it as a, a men's weepy epic or something. And it it really looks, I think, at masculinity and age. I think age is a, is a great thing. The great thing for me about it, I mean, obviously they asked me to do it and I said, give it to Tom. He's old, he's a pensioner now. He needs the money, doesn't he? You know what I mean? I can't, can't take the gig. <laughs> can't take the gig. But um, no, he's he's great in it and he's happy to be great. Does that make sense? He's, he's, he's loving every moment. He's filming it. He's, he's smiling throughout. Um, I think he really enjoyed himself, and that's what made the film great. Because he can fly in real life. He owns a P-51, I believe. Yeah, I don't want to spoil anything for you, but yeah, his aircraft is in that. His, his oh, aircraft is, is in the film. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. And, and right. yeah, he's in the film. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I like it. It's worth going to see. It, it could have been, because it was made in the era, or the, the peak woke era, wasn't it? And it could have been right. like that, and it, it isn't at all. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Well, I will check it out. Yeah, it isn't uh, at all. I, I was really worried. Then. I was slating it. I was like, it's going to be rubbish. But no, <laughs> he's uh, done a good job there. 
yeah. So I do want to ask you another kind of sort of fairly serious question about wokeness before we move on from that. But one last thing, just when you see like an, uh, a film like Top Gun or the remake or any movie, any TV drama where you see fast jets in it or even any airplane, do you sometimes, do you ever notice, oh, that's, that's so wrong, you know? Oh, like, all the time. Uh, yeah, it's a film. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a film though. And the majority of jet flying is quite tedious to be fair. Um, <laughs> you've got to think about what you're doing. I'm, I'm sat in a cockpit strapped in. I can't move. I've got G-pants on. I've got a life vest. Okay, so if we go through what... So being a jet pilot is actually quite hard work. Not You've, you've got to put your long johns in, which are fire-resistant material. Then you've got to put a flight suit over the top, which is fire-resistant material. Then you've got your G-pants. You've got your life preserver. You've got a helmet. You've got your gloves. You've got bits of metal around your legs where the ejection seat um, lanyards go through. You attach the ejection seat to the top of your arms here. To, so as you leave the aircraft, it rips your whole of your line of your life vest and keeps your hands down here so you don't get flaying injuries. So you've got all that. And you're connected to oxygen, which is which you're force feeding anyway. Um, during the flight, whenever you pull G, your, your trousers inflate and cause a lot of pressure. Um, and most of the time, you're transiting somewhere. You're at low level, transiting to a target. And then there's about 20 seconds of pure terror. And then you, you transit home again. And then you land a jet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you see the film, I won't ruin it. I mean, I was an electronic warfare instructor, so my speciality was SA-2s, SA-3s, SA-6, 11s, all these surface air missile systems, enemy radar systems. So, of course, I look at it. And my wife was loving it. She's there going, oh, it's amazing, jet pilot, so cool. I'm like, yeah, we do that. <laughs> yeah, all that, that, all that. She tells people that all the time. She's like, oh, it's so uncool being a jet pilot. I'll be married to a jet pilot. I mean, I'm like, shut up, big me up, isn't it? big me up. Have you ever been tempted to tell people you've done stuff that you have done? Oh, yeah, no, no I, I've taken out. No, I've taken out I don't, seven I, MIGs personally in one day once. No, <laughs> I, don't I wouldn't even, expect you would. No, I'm not <laughs> that guy. I don't, no, no, I wouldn't expect you the to. Lessons I, silly question. No, 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 it's fine. But the lessons <laughs> I take across, the lessons I try and give out are, are more um, tangible, usable lessons about either, either learning or uh, you know career development, whatever it might be, that, that help people out. The, the background and things we do, you know, I'd love to move on to something else now, but it's I don't have that 20-year investment and to get it and take another 20 years. Um, I don't know what I'd do. I mean, you're talking downstairs about what, what you did previously. And that's interesting to me. I'm like, oh, it's really cool. But I know it's not. You know, I know bits of it is not. And and so moving into another industry now is would be difficult. And I'd be at the bottom. And I don't want to do business development. So I use those lessons and I, I present them in many different kind of ways I can. But mm. no, no one. I don't know any any pilots that would really talk about stuff they haven't done. Right, yeah, no. A, but their mates, would, uh, their mates would call them out anyway. Uh, right, so, yeah, yeah. yeah I feel like almost like comically when you realise you're speaking to someone who really knows nothing about it. Yeah, uh, I see uh, yeah, yeah. You, sort you of could say, do that, uh, you? Oh, yeah, I, uh, I, oh, well, yeah, no, you wouldn't dream of it. But um, I remember one time you're talking about you've met some F-22 dudes. Mm. And I remember you saying that they're just uh, well, sort of, sort of the creme de la creme. Yeah, I was very impressed of, actually. Uh, that yeah. they were, they've got sort of skills that are just above and beyond. <clears throat> I remember you saying that a guy realised he was, he, he quit because it was so intense or he realised yeah, he, he was towards the end of his career anyway and he realised they were sort of targeting things behind them That's right. and it, it just sort of blew his mind. Blew his mind. He was, the, <laughs> he was the base commander and he was flying with young F-22 pilots. Um, he was in charge of the base they were on. He can fly, he can fly the aircraft and he did the workup and everything. And they're young, young people that, that fly airplanes now are, are, they put a lot of work in, put that way, you know, and, and they're very talented and the aircraft are very complicated and I've got a lot of time for them. It was a real privilege to train some of them up. You know, I've got a lot of time. And in America, the F-22 is renowned as being, you know, you send the best people onto that jet. And we're all nerds, right? So we're all geeks. Don't get me wrong. Don't think, you know, jet pilots are cool and playing volleyball and stuff like that. I love that, but they're not. <laughs> they're all, you know, they're all just absolute geeks. Because you've got to read the manuals and you've got to read the books and you've got to learn a load of stuff. And More you... Nigel Manson than James Hunt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it Sex Breakfast of Champions? Wasn't it? That was James Hunt, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. died early, of course, didn't he? It's a shame. He did, yeah. You just keep budgery guards. It's, it's a great autobiography I read of him. Anyway, he was a heavy smoker, wasn't he? It heavy. Didn't and help. Drugs as well, wasn't it? You know, How was it? Yeah, a lot, a lot of drugs he took as well, recreational drugs. And I mm. think that just shortened his life. And he mm. had a heart attack, didn't he? He was around a mate's house or something. He was um, very young, yeah. It's really good to read about him, though. I like that. He lived his life, I see, because this is us going off tangents, because you do this to me. Um, he lived his life twice as fast, really, didn't he? So yeah, all his years, he yeah, just condensed, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, burn very brightly. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, yeah, like rock stars that die early, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Fair play to him if they wanted to do it. 
you know. Uh, I used to see there was a lot left in him and him keeping budgery guards and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And his, his backstory is, was lovely. The whole thing is lovely. Uh, he had a relationship with Murray Walker, didn't he? At the end when he used to commentate with them, they used to hate each other. And then they kind of warmed to each other. Old school F1. Old school F1. Don't get me talking about that now. Oh, well, yeah. no, <laughs> me but, too. Uh, <laughs> but no, the F22 guys, that guy was the commander and he found himself just absolutely maxed out, we call it, like cognitively impaired in a, in a fight with all these young people. And he came down afterwards and went, I can't do it anymore. And uh, yeah. I remember saying, that's, he said, there are some clever people, you know, that fly yeah. that airplane. Most of them then go into an astronaut program or something. Right. Or they, uh, you know, um, there it's is, crazily brave and honest, isn't it? I mean, oh, there is that kind yeah, of beautifully brave and honest to say, yeah. okay, I'm out of my, I'm like an instructor for this thing. And yet it, the truth is I'm out of my depth here. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that's great leadership, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I mean, exactly that. And uh, I think you see quite a lot of that in flying because if you don't do that, people die and their mates are yours. So right. you come back and you're open and honest about what you did. I remember there was a Frenchman on our squadron. I was really trying to get a culture in of this honesty on the squadron. Like there is honesty, but just say, guys, we could learn a lot more from each other if we, if we, if we just bury the egos a little bit and we, you know, I mean, there aren't massive egos anyway, but you've got to have a bit of confidence to get in these jets because you know, the big old airplanes and you've yeah. got a lot of fuel behind you and someone's attached a rocket to it. You know, it's a bit weird. And I said, look, we could be a bit honest with this. And then people started opening up and it all really changed when a mate of mine who's a French pilot who I could never be in, in air combat talk. And the French are very, very good at this stuff. He stood up in a Met brief once and the French are, uh, French pilots um, are, are sort of renowned for their arrogance and scarf and what's, well, you know, they, they just, are. I don't know why they just are. And this guy was the reverse of that. This guy was the most humble dude ever. One of the best fighter pilots I've ever seen. Like what he could do with our airplanes against us. I could never even, he would tell me, he would, he would show me videos of how to do it. And he would go through the three dimensional stuff and how to use the speed and the buffet and how to use angles. I even flew with him in an airplane and he even showed me what he was doing. I still couldn't replicate. He still beat me around the sky. <laughs> there was a couple of guys in the squadron I could never touch. And he was one of them. And it was just fantastic. And, um, and I remember him standing up in a, in a Met brief, so the early morning brief where we have the weather. And he put his hand up and he said, I want to um, tell people what happened yesterday. And he'd made an error and he explained all. And he was such a senior guy as well. Then from then on, everyone realized on the squadron that you could be honest, you could be open. And it was funny because I, I do some work with some businesses now. Doesn't really happen in, in businesses. I, I, I work with some city businesses. It, it, people wouldn't do that. Mm. And I think mm. they're worried about Mm. either they if they did it other people in the business won't do it so they will look stupid and might lose their job um but the business would would grow if people mm. were open and honest about errors they were making mm. or the fact that they may be out their debt somewhere mm. and could someone give them a hand mm. uh you think about that in a business it's, mm. it's crazy wild you know that trust yeah that's the thing because the navy seals they they do that on on trust they don't look for the best guy they look for on their on their seal team six special forces team they don't look for the best operators to go in there they look for the you know, ones that are really good, but ones that are really trustworthy. Right. And yes. uh, those are the ones they pick. So. Yeah, no, you mentioned that before. And that's like, yeah. oh, it must be huge, such a huge thing, cause especially if in, say, a, a tornado or something, there's two of you in there. Yeah. And you're putting, I can imagine, you're putting your, you're trusting them with your life uh, yeah. in all different ways. You know, yeah. it's. Uh, there's no stick in the back. You know, there's no, there's no controls in the back. All right. Um, we have a commander jack, so the nav can fire me out and he comes with me. But he can also fire himself out or she can fire herself out and I stay in the jet. So sometimes you rely on that person to save you, you know, and they yeah. rely on you as well. Especially when they are head down in the in the in the ground mapping radar and the weaponeering in the back and they're setting a few settings and they've just got their head down, they're not even looking out. And there we are at hundred feet doing nine miles a minute or something, you know, and they're just they're just busy. And they normally say head down. They will say head down. Uh, right, so um, you know that they're not even yeah. looking. And if I have to look in, I'm like, I'm head down, you know, and which means I'm I'm looking at my kit, I'm not looking out. So they'd be like, <laughs> you know what you say? <laughs> but no, it's yeah, you do. And you don't think about it. It's second nature, you know. Yeah. It must you, be. you trust those people, they trust you. So yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it must be. Oh God, there's so many more things, but unfortunately, we're coming right to the end of our time, I'm afraid. A um, couple of very quick things then, if that's all right, just for the last few minutes. Um, we've got the Jubilee weekend coming up. Yes. We are recording this uh, just before. Yes. Um, so it hasn't happened yet, but it will go out on the internet after it's already oh, happened. Yeah, yeah. But it hasn't happened yet. But there will be a big fly past, right? Yes. And I've seen a video you've done before in previous years with uh, some of the chaps that are involved in yeah. sort of royal birthday mm. fly past and all, th all that sort of stuff. Um, so, but I imagine, I actually don't know, I'm genuinely asking you this question. I don't know the answer. I imagine there'll be a, an extra big one. 
Nikki yeah, I would have thought they'd be and, and stuffing jets into that. Yeah. And I mean, do you know? Have you spoken to any of the people? That I, are I genuinely be don't have much that, information yeah. on it. To be fair, I, I was in I was in one over London. Um, well, I was in a couple over London. In fact, in my time. Um, oh, where you personally flew in them? Yeah. So we did oh, a big right. E2R. Um, there's a video on the internet you can find if you type E2R or, or I think it was the Queen's. Must have been uh, Jubilee. What's she? I can't remember which one. Is it Platinum now? Isn't it? Yeah. So I can't remember which one it was. To be fair, Silver. Maybe I don't know. A few years back now. Uh, where we took down 28 aircraft and made the E2R flew over Windsor Palace. And the Queen actually clapped us. She didn't clap anyone else. Mm-hmm. She clapped us. Mm-hmm. But the Queen loves it. I mean, the Queen, she's our boss, right? So I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a huge royalist. And I know that, well, hopefully people watching your channel feel very similar to this. But even if they don't, I understand it. I think she does such great work. And the whole royal family do such great work for the country. Um, yeah, that's where I am with it. But yeah, so I think what they would do, they'll put jets together. And it's very interesting how we do a fly past. Um, there's a lot of weight turbulence so you step jets down or aircraft down from each other because there's weight turbulence behind them and then it dissipates as it gets a bit less so you sort of try and sit else you're fighting the controls being in formation the jets are all over the place I remember I was in one had a mate of mine Steve on the wing there was a Nimrod we are on this is going back now four tornadoes and a Nimrod and uh, we're on the wing and it's Nimrod so Nimrod's a j- massive yeah Nimrod was the um, the, the submarine hunting airplane right. big four engine thing a huge thing and uh which side was I? Oh, yeah. So there was two jets on the wing, like touching the wing. And I was outboard on this side. So I had a tornado, then the Nimrod. And then there was another guy over here. And then there was my mate, Steve. <laughs> and all of us were saturating the controls because you can oversaturate the controls. It's just there was so much turbulence coming from all the aircraft ahead of us. And I'm, I'm like fighting this thing. And we're talking in the in this thing. We're saying, just stay in here because it's the queen, right? Stay in. So you know, don't don't ping out. Like if you've got to hit an aircraft, you get hit, stay in for the queen. And we stayed in. And as we turned off target, Steve pinged out. It was too much for him. He was like, I've just, you know, I'm tasked. Look, he literally saturated the controls of the jet and it wasn't doing what he wanted to do. And he was like, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. And you just end up climbing away. It was some of the hardest flying I've ever done. So when you see that fly past and you see those guys in there, especially the guys on the big heavy aircraft, if there are people on the wings of heavies, um, it is, depending on what the weather conditions are, it is actually a really hard thing to do. Because right. there's hot air coming up from London. That's yeah. turbulent. There's, you know, it depends what height you're at as well. There's turbulence coming off all the other aircraft. I think the rotaries are, I think the rotaries go ahead because of that reason, the helicopters. And then, yeah, the last jets are just fighting themselves as they as they come through. <laughs> but it'll be a long stream of uh, hopefully everything that we've got. The F-35s will be there, which would be great. Got typhoons. Um I guess we, everything's pretty much going to be there for her because she owns them, doesn't she? The Rares. Yeah. You know what I mean? She owns them I all. I think it might be her last, could possibly, well, be the last big jubilee, I'm sure. She doesn't die. Um, we don't die. What are you talking about? Doesn't die. <laughs> <laughs> so sacrilege. She's to, here forever. What to are you mention. About? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, she's God, great. There's so many more things I wanted to ask you about, uh, but I'm, af- I'm afraid we've got to draw it to an end there. But um, I just talking about sort of, I'd love to pick your brain about the f- your ideas about the future of aircraft possibly completely unmanned i'd love to ask you all about drones yeah, yeah. Last, love to ask you all about do you remember the red bull air race do you remember yes. they used to do that yes and yes. acrobatics and all absolutely that sort of yeah yeah is that absurd to you or is no, it no. bloody brilliant i loved it yeah um, yeah yeah well ben murphy ex red one from the um he's a mate of mine and his wife Kirsty. uh he was a red bull pilot actually he left the uh, left the reds and he went and flew some red bull stuff i don't know how it went i think he did all right you know what i mean but yeah i think they took a break didn't they for a couple of years yeah, well, they no, someone nearly died yeah, they had a crash right. yeah, and, and they, they just, were like well, uh, let's maybe yeah just push it yeah i mean that is that is like full-on 10g stuff and then I, I'm not. I, well, if I don't have G pants on when I pull G, I, I feel really nauseous. I don't know why. So um, I'm not interested. In, I've got nothing to press against. So uh, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think that's. There's for a me. guy called Bonhomme something. Yeah, that's Bonhomme. right. Paul Bonhomme. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a Brit. Wasn't very he? famous guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was excellent. I yeah, think he right. won it one time. Or was yeah, I'm always sure up did. there. He was very, very good. Um, well, Tim, again, thank you for your time. I'd love to have you down. back sometime because I sure. really have just scratched the surface. Um, no, it's, it's great. Thanks um, so much. Always yeah, good. perhaps we can talk uh, a bit more about sort of the culture wars instead of um, sort of flight. Or it's- well, you guys need to keep doing that. Someone <laughs> right. needs to keep doing that. Okay, you got to keep putting that pressure on. I must admit, I share your videos all the time. So, um, you know, I thank really you. do. So, yeah, keep keep that keep that work up because it's, uh, it's very important work you do. All right, well, thank you. Thanks again. That's great. Okay, until next time, uh, take care. Bye-bye.